in an upstairs apartment by the light of the late afternoon sun, a man sits alone, writing feverishly. I can't help but wonder how much his hand must be shaking. I wonder the thoughts that he's thinking. Page after page, Paul writes the book of Romans. It's just one book, but it's filled with everything that he knows to be true about God. And for the first two and a half chapters, man, it's been some pretty harsh words. You're not good enough. You can never be good enough. You're broken and you can't be fixed. Oh, and if you think I'm not talking about you, well, I'm talking about you. Oh, and if you think you've lived a pretty good life and you've always tried to do what's right, well, I'm still talking about you. Two and a half chapters just to explain that from head to toe, what you think, what you say, what you do, where you go, man, we've all done wrong. He goes, not one single person. God won't find one person to be declared perfect in his sight. And as I said last week, if the book of Romans ended before this verse, I would never teach it. It would be the worst book in the entire Bible because it would be hopeless for us up until verse 20. I can't make it to God. You can't make it to God. No one can. So what's the point? Because somewhere, at some point, at some time in our lives, we have all messed up. And so what does that leave us with? Hell. Hell. That's what we deserve. That's where we're headed on our own. Eternal separation from God's love. Eternal torture eternal pain, eternal suffering. That is what we are going to receive. That's what we deserve. Because we're not perfect. And with what you deserve in mind, we jump into verse 21, and we read those beautiful words. Those first two words that change everything. Those first two words that turn this whole book completely around. Those first two words that can turn your entire life around. But now. But now. Let me show you the answer. Paul says, I had to spend two and a half chapters to show you how sick you were so you could take the cure. And when we ended up last week, I challenged you to look up four different words. Do you remember that? Because in order for us to understand the meaning, the power, and the love behind but now, we really need to understand these four words. Four kind of churchy words that we've all heard before. But these are going to be the four words that will unlock the power and the meaning of but now. And I hope that you did your homework last week because we're going to jump right in beginning with these four words. And the first one is one of the smallest words in the entire Bible. It's only three letters. And yet it has such a devastating impact on our lives, on you and on me. Simply the word sin. Sin. We talk about it a lot. It's written a lot. And it means to not have union. To not have union. And, and now if, you, if you'll forgive me a minute, I want to geek out on you a little bit because I really love the Greek language. And there's something really important to see here. The Greek word for sin is hamartia. And that little A at the beginning of the word in the Greek language, means that it negates everything that comes behind, everything that's about to happen. Whatever comes after that A, it's the opposite of. 
So for example, you can have the word theist in the English language. A person who believes in God or gods is a theist. But an atheist is one who does not believe. That A is the opposite of whatever follows it. So it shows up in words like apathy. It's from the Greek word apothos. That A at the beginning negates the word pothos, which is to feel or to yield. And so apathy, apothos, is without feeling or without yielding. So in the word hamartia, the A at the beginning negates what follows. And meros is having union or having a relationship with or having a part of. So sin is not having relationship, not being a part of, not having union with. And it's kind of interesting because the word hamartia became an archery term. Back in the medieval age, way, way before Robin Hood, you would shoot an arrow at a target. And if the arrow hits the center of the bullseye, it has union with it. That's where it's supposed to be. And any time you're off, you've missed the target, you are hamartia. You're not in union. You're not a part of that bullseye. And that's kind of a great picture of what sin does. It breaks our relationship with others and with God. This is sin. And this is what Paul's trying to drive home. Hamartia, sin, is the reason for conflict and, and confusion in this world. There's a, there's a union, there's a relationship that has been broken about how we do life and humanity. We are hamartia. We are out of relationship. We are out of union. If perfection is the bullseye on a target, we've all missed the mark. Now, some of us might have missed it by just a little bit, and some maybe by a lot. But it doesn't matter how much. All of us have missed it. We all have hamartia, not having union or share. The second word I gave you was a little bit bigger word. It was the word atonement, or if you have an older Bible, yours might say propitiation. We don't really use that term anymore. Now the term is atonement. Most of us have heard that term before, but what is it? Well, it's actually a religious term. It means to appease a god. Civilizations from, from the earliest humanity thought that there was a god that you needed to get to like you. And if you didn't, he would cause all kinds of disasters to come your way. He would become an angry god. He would cause your crops not to grow. He would cause a famine in your land. And if he were really angry, he would cause fire and earthquakes. And to appease a god, especially an angry god, you bring sacrifices, usually animals. Because only a living sacrifice could appease an angry God. In many civilizations, it would even be human sacrifices, infants or virgins. So atonement is basically a, a religious term about how you go about appeasing an angry God. Oh, and notice I used small g up there because it's been a religious term for all kinds of different beliefs and philosophies throughout human history. That's that's what atonement is. And the next word we need to understand is justification. Justification is a, a legal term, and it means to be made right. To be made right. It's not just to be found innocent, but to be made right. You now supersede anything that the law has on you. You have gone above and beyond doing anything that the law requires. And you are found right. And then maybe on your note sheet, right next to the word justification, you might want to write the word righteousness next to it. It's the exact same word in the Greek language. Justification and righteousness are the same word 
and they mean to be found right. Uh, it's, it's a legal term that a judge would use when, when he knows the law and he looks at your life and he says, you are not guilty. In fact, you're innocent. You're found right. And for two and a half chapters, Paul has been writing, man, none of us are perfect. We might think we're better than others, but that's not the point. Paul says God, look, God cannot look at all of humanity and find one single perfect person. He goes, you've all got hamartia, sin. You've all missed the mark at some point or another. So stop judging yourself against those who have missed it by further than you did. The point is you're all off. I love the way a man named Barclay wrote it about it. He said, if God justifies a sinner, if God justifies a sinner, it doesn't mean that he finds reason to prove the sinner was right. Far from it. It doesn't even mean that he makes the sinner into a good person. What Paul's about to say is that God's righteousness is put on me. Barclay says, God treats the sinner as if you've never sinned at all. It's not my righteousness. It's God taking his righteousness and putting it on me. He doesn't say, Bill, now I'm going to treat you as if you haven't sinned. He doesn't say, Bill, I'm going to make you a better, perfect life. He doesn't say, he, he, he takes his righteousness, his holiness, his perfection, and he says, there, Bill, that's what you're going to wear now. And the fourth term we asked, I asked you to look at last week is the term redemption. Redemption. It's a, it's a slavery term. And it simply means to buy one's freedom. Very rarely in recorded history do we ever find a slave being able to buy their way out of slavery, to buy their own freedom. But there have been times where a slave, out of an act of loyalty, or maybe an act of heroics, or maybe, maybe something of valor, he has, he has caught someone else's attention. And that someone will come down and buy that slave out of slavery. And that, that freed person that was once a slave is given a, a certificate, a paper of some type, that says you are no longer under someone else's rule. You're freed. Redemption is a, is a slavery term. To buy back, to buy someone out of, to set free. And so with those four terms in mind, I want you to watch what Paul says, starting in chapter 3, verse 21. He says, you're all in the same boat. You've all sinned from head to toe. It's taken me two and a half chapters to let you know you've missed the mark. But now, I love those words, but now. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets uh, testify. He says, but now this righteousness from God, remember that term? To be made right by God. He says, this is apart from the law. This isn't, this isn't about scripture. This isn't about you being religious. It's apart from that. This whole book has been about what God is doing. He's doing something one day to bring righteousness to you. The whole book goes all the way back to Abraham and a promise where God says, out of you, I'm going to make a great nation. Out of you, I'm going to bring salvation. Paul says this isn't something new. This isn't something that some guy named Jesus just walked around with his boys and, and made up. He goes, this is what all of history, the entire Old Testament, has been pointing to. But now we see God's plan. But now you can be made right. But now you can be found innocent. Verse 22. 
This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between the Jew and the... Wait, wait, wait. Let's go back and read that again. This righteousness from God is not something you do. It's not something you earn. It's simply given through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says, guys, this is for everyone. I know, Jews, you think it's just for you. I know that you think the Messiah is yours and yours alone. It's not. It's for everyone, Jew and Gentile. And then he goes on. He says, for all have sinned. All of us have missed the mark. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Don't think you're better than me. Don't think you're worse than me. It doesn't matter. We've all missed the mark. And he says, all are freely, just all are justified freely by, by how good we are, by how smart we are, by how rich we are, by how good looking we are. No. We're justified freely by his grace and grace alone through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. He says, that's why I took so much time to let you know that you're broken in this relationship. You're not in union. You're not in relationship. Something is wrong in your life. And he says, that's sin. I spent two and a half chapters trying to boil it down. But now, let me tell you how you can be made right. He says, it's grace, it's faith. You can be justified. You can be found right. He wants to redeem you. He wants to buy you back. He wants to take you out of your sin and out of the life that you've tried to live on your own. He wants to set you free. And he's going to pay the price for this to happen. Because I don't care how good you are, even with the slightest amount of sin in your life, it is impossible for you to get to God. Impossible. You see, God's perfect, and, and heaven's a place of perfection, which means get over yourself. You're not allowed. You've all fallen short. And Paul says, I've spent three chapters trying to tell you, but now you can be made perfect. But now you can be seen as perfect. But now he wants to redeem you. He wants to buy you out of that life and out of the, the, the sin that you're under. Verse 25. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of his atonement. There's that word. Through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He says, you see, God, God has appeased the wrath that he has for me. Because he took it out on his son. Jesus died on the cross to atone for my sins. Jesus died on the cross because I'm the one that deserves a trip out back to the woodshed. I deserve a whooping. I deserve hell. The amount of debt that I owe to a, to a holy and just God, I can't pay for that. The amount of wrong that I've done, somebody has to pay. And he goes, that's what God did for you through Jesus Christ. He wanted to redeem you, to buy your freedom to, through the atonement of blood. Let's go on in verse 25. He says, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time. So as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Did, did, you, did you catch that? Four times in three verses, he says it. Why did he take it out on Jesus? Why did Jesus have to die for you? Why did he have to die for me? Four times, Paul says, because God is a just God. He has justice. He did it to show his justice. Why? Because he's a just God. And this is something you really, really need to understand. 
because we don't like an angry God. We don't like to think about God's wrath. We just want a loving God where, where everything's going to be okay, no matter how much we mess up, no matter what kind of life we're leading. But think about that for a minute. If a parent did that, we'd say that's a terrible parent. No matter how obnoxious or rude or mean or horrible a child is, they just simply say, oh, that's all right. It's okay, no problem. Oh, oh, you ditched school and you went out with your buddies drinking and taking drugs today? How sweet. No problem. Oh, you broke into someone's house and stole their TV and their handgun so you could go down to rob a liquor store. Oh, you aren't you smart. You're so cute. That's not a loving parent. But that's what we want in God. That doesn't make sense. And so four times, Paul says, because of all the sins you've committed, he hasn't punished you. In his patience, in his forbearance, he's let you go with those. And you're thinking that, well, that doesn't mean God approves of the way I'm living my life. He says, no, God isn't. God is just waiting to show his justice, his justice, his justice, his justice, four times. He says, if he doesn't punish sin, he's not a just God. And if he's not a just God, he's no God at all. Yes, he is a loving God, but he is a just God. And a just God looks at all the wrong I've ever done and says, somebody's got to pay for that. And every day, my list gets longer and longer and longer. And I would bet that we would all admit that there's some evil in the world that should be punished. But we never add our names to that list, do we? Whenever we want God to punish evil, we're, we're just above that line. Isn't that kind of strange? Earlier this week, some gender-confused person shot their way into a Christian school in Tennessee and began to open, their, open fire on anyone that was inside. And as I'm watching this story unfold on television, I'm thinking, man, I hope there's justice. I hope there's justice. I hope that somewhere there will be justice for people like that. I mean, not people like me, but people like that. And the Bible says, oh, Bill, Bill, you follow a just God. Don't you understand? You're on that list too. And if God has to punish sin, where does he draw the line? A just God will punish all sin. He has to. And he goes, Bill, you've got quite a list going. Now, you may not be a murderer. You may not be an adulterer. You may not be a thief. But, Bill, have you taken a look at your list? Well, church, I promise you, God will be just. Which means someone has to atone for every wrong that you've ever done. Because a just God that only punishes really bad people and, and stops at some point, that's, that's just an arbitrary God that draws a magical line, and that's not justice. What Paul's trying to get out is this, this universal problem over and over again, that sin, hamartia, separates us from ourselves. He goes, let me tell you the issue, Bill, from head to toe. Don't think for somebody else today. Don't think this is about someone else. This has got your name on it. He says, from your mind, from your motives, from the stuff you've said, from everything you've ever done, Bill, you have got a sin issue. And that sin separates you from the man God made you to be. It separates you from the person you were made to be. He says, you're not even a fraction of the man that you were designed to be. He goes, Bill, look at yourself. Don't look at others. Look inwardly. And all I can do is go, yeah, look what I'm prone to do. 
Look at my thoughts. Look at my motives. Look at my desires. Look at my track record. And we're broken. We're marred. We all have hamartia. We're no longer in union, in relationship with God. We have broken that. Sin separates us from that. I love James 4.1 that says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? And that's why we don't have the relationships we're supposed to have. It's my greed. It's my arrogance. It's my deceit. Why is your marriage such a struggle? Because you're a sinner. And guess what? You married a sinner. And now the two of you, even in the best of marriages, find it a struggle. Where does that come from? Is it something outside blocking your love, blocking your intimacy? No, it's all here inside. It's my jealousy. It's my desires. It's my arrogance that puts my wants ahead of hers. It's me keeping score, keeping track in case I get a chance to use this against you down the road. We all have hamartia. We're out of partnership. We're, we're out of fellowship. We don't have union. That's why the past two and a half chapters have been so stinking hard to listen to. Because we want to think, well, I haven't done anything God to make God angry with me. And Paul says again and again and again, guess what? This is about you. Don't be thinking, oh, you, you know who should be here to hear this today? Guess who, brought God, guess who God brought here to hear this today? You. This is about you. This is about me. This isn't a message that I go, man, I can't wait to preach this one because there's some of you guys that really need this. No, I sat there and I said, Bill, if there wasn't a but now, it'd be hopeless. I'd be lost. My own sin has separated me from a holy God. But now. But now we know what God has done with that sin. He will atone his wrath by taking it out on his son. Not because I deserve it, but because of his love for me. He will atone for that, and believing that, you will be justified, a, a, a legal term. He says he will find you not just innocent, but he will take his righteousness, his holiness, his perfection, boom, he puts it on you. And he says that happens no matter who you are. That happens no matter what you have done. He says, I will be, I will deal with that sin. I will bring you into a relationship with me. So when you get to heaven, it is, it is no more. It's wiped clean. Yes, you're still going to live with the consequences of sin down here on earth. You will. But he says, I'm redeeming you. I'm freeing you from that. You are no longer under the slavery of sin. But now... And in the next four verses, just come screaming off of the pages. I, I wonder at this point if Paul's hand is just, just flying frantically as he's trying to get these words out. He wants to tell the entire Roman Empire, here's what I found. Here's what I know to be true about God. And this is coming from a guy that tried to be religious. A guy that tried to be so holy and follow all the rules and, and, and be so righteous. He says, but I was dead inside. Paul says, I know what I've done. I used to kill Christians. But now, I know what I've found. It's a faith thing, and it's, it is freely given to you. And by the way, in the next four verses... Paul says, may I remind you, there is, there is one God of all the people. One God of the Jews. One God of the Gentiles. There is one faith, and guess what? There is only one answer. But do you see what Paul has done these last four weeks? It's almost as if we, we went into a doctor's office. 
Paul has called us together. And we go into this doctor's office, and he sits down with this. And he's looking at this clipboard, and he's like, hmm, let me see here. Man, I wish I could make this easy for you. But this is bad. It's really, really bad. Bill, you're sick. I know you're going to walk out of here, you're going to feel, say, I don't feel sick. I don't think I'm sick. He says, so I'm going to write it down for you. I'm going to write it in three chapters. He says, Bill, we've done every single test we can do on you. And, and buddy, there's an issue. In fact, at this point, it's throughout your entire system. It's from head to toe. And Bill, you're not going to like this, but it's hereditary. Your wife has it. Your kids have it. It's going to kill you. It's going to wipe out your entire family. So I want you to sit down and listen because I'm going to painstakingly go through it and how bad you are. Because until you understand what you're into and what you're prepared for and what lays ahead of you, he says, you're never going to take the cure. Bill, can we talk about 78 and 79? And I'm like, you mean 1978? He's like, yeah. Rather not. He goes, well, I just want to mention that we have doctor-patient confidentiality here. Tell me about 1982. And I'm like, no. No, we're good. I'd pass on that one. Bill, we ran a scan. You've got an incredibly dark spot that appears between 1985 and 1989. You know what that's about? Would you like to share? Bill, I'm telling you, it'll stay right here. No. No, I'm good. Bill, it seems like things have gotten a little better lately. And I'm like, yeah, I fixed all that. I'm, I'm, I'm good now. And he says, yeah, I thought you were going to say that. Let's talk about the ego, the pride that comes into your life because of how you're doing. And Dr. Paul takes page after page after page and says, we're not going to talk about somebody else today. I want you to know this is bad for you. And I know it's hard to sit through. But I'm going to go through every reason that you have about, well, that's not me. Or about how I'm a different person now. Or about how you don't know where I've come from or what's been done to me. Or, or, or better yet, now I have religion. He says, oh, church, this is about you. This is about me. Dr. Paul says, I'm going to hit everything just so you can understand. I'm dead, aren't I? He goes, yeah, you are. And so there's no hope, is there? And he says, no. But then he looks up from his charts And he says, but now, but now let me tell you what's going to fix this. And one by one, he goes through and lets me know, you simply have faith. It's, it's nothing you can do. You simply have to take it freely. You simply have to have faith that Jesus atoned for your sin that whatever God has against you, he took out on his son. And man, you have a huge debt. In fact, page after page after page against you. And all that can be atoned for to appease God's anger. You can be justified through Jesus, justified in spite of your sin, in spite of who you are, in spite of what you have done. You can be seen as perfect, not just a good bill, not just a better bill. You can be seen as complete and holy. That's God taking his righteousness and putting it on you. And all you have to do is receive it. And Bill, you can be redeemed from all of your sin, all of it. You will be brought back. And yeah, you're going to have to sign over the pink slip. You're going to have a new owner. 
but he's going to free you from the slavery that sin had over you. So I know it's been a tough three or four weeks. It has. But I wanted you to see, man, this chart has your name on it. And until you understand that, I don't think you'll ever see, you'll ever appreciate, you'll ever, un, you'll ever grasp how much you need this cure. He says, there's a courtroom, son. And one day you're going to have to take this chart and you're going to stand before God with it. And God's going to look at it and he's going to go, are you kidding me? He's going to say, Bill, you are so guilty. But I love you, Bill. I'm a, I'm a God of justice. Sin has got to be punished. You lived your life as if there was no God. And that's going to depend, demand a life apart from me. You've lived your life as if you haven't wanted me. So guess what? Now forever you're going to be without me. And right about then, Jesus would walk up. And he would roll up his sleeves. And he would show me the scars. And he will drop the robe off of his back. And he will show me the welts where chunks of flesh were, were removed from the bone. And he will show me the scars or the thorns. And Paul is writing, God is offering this to you. Not because you deserve it, but because of his overwhelming love for you. You either have to pay your own debt or, or, or you can take what Jesus did for you. And if you want to accept that, that will cover the bill. Because otherwise, Bill, you've got to pay it yourself. And Paul knows as he writes the third chapter of the book of Romans, he, he knows this is what the Roman Empire so desperately needs right now. And God knows this is what we need this morning, right now. If you're a longtime Christian, man, you've already said, Bill, I've done that. And that's great. But may this be a reminder to you of the mercy and the forgiveness that has been given to you. And for those of you who are just sitting here gone or maybe watching us online going, Bill, you know, I've never really done that yet. I've never brought my debt and just laid it to the feet of Jesus. I've never freely taken this cure. Man, I'm ready to do that today. I'm going to close today in prayer. And as I close, I'm just going to ask you to pray along with me. Here in this building, or wherever you're watching us online, right for where you are, it's just between you and God. It's free. Pray with me, would you? Father, thank you for bringing me here today. I really, really needed to hear this. God, I know I've done a lot wrong in my life. and I just want to say I'm sorry. I haven't lived my life your way. And today I realize you know every single wrong thing I've ever done. And yet you still love me. And you want to bring relationship back between you and me. So God, thank you for taking out your wrath on your son. Thank you for paying whatever debt I have against you. Thank you for paying for everything that I've ever done wrong. God, today I just want to accept that. And I ask you to make me new again. I willingly pray for you to redeem me. Save me from the life I've been living and teach me how to follow you. Father, show me how much you love me so that I can learn to love you as well. Thanks for taking me. From this day on, I'm yours. Help me to live for you. And God, for the rest of us here today, may these three or four weeks bring us back to what you've done for us. That we've screwed up, we've screwed up, we've screwed up, we've screwed up over and over and over just to get us to the point of finding, but now, but now, here's the answer. But now, here's what you've done for us. Oh God, thank you. Thank you. Help us to be people that show your love, your grace, and your mercy to others. And we thank you, God, for what you did for us. 
in spite of who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Thank you for being here this morning. Please come back next Sunday. But in the meantime, as we wrap up this message on chapter 3, I, I don't think there will ever be a message taught at Crossroads better than this one. I really don't. It has nothing to do with who's speaking. It's the story. If I could just pick one message to preach every single time for the rest of my life, this would be it. Oh, friends, I, I hope you sat here and realized, man, this is the best news ever. The most amazing news ever. We're going to pick it up in two weeks. And I'm going to tell you a story about Abraham and how this all works out. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And you can read ahead. It's okay. But next week, please come back for a very special Easter service. So in, while you're at it, invite someone to come to church with you. God bless you.